Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I review different products that I have, um, different RPG books and things like that. Uh, this week I thought I'd do a bunch of zines, or sort of zine-like things. I have a handful here. I don't know how long this video is going to be because I don't think I can do a full review of each of them. But kind of a quick flip through more than anything else. This one first is, uh, it's not even open, so I can't do much of a review on it, except just to give you guys a sense of um, maybe what it is. So this is the Advanced Dungeon Goons book or uh, adventure pack, basically. It's it's really small, right? But uh, if you can see, the art there is just awesome. It's by Jacob Fleming. Um, it's classic old school art. And of course, the design is made to look like uh, an old NES game or something like that. Um, Dungeon Goons is a really simple game. This, this pack comes with an adventure, the rule book, a couple character sheets, and a couple dice. Now, as you can see back here, now, I haven't opened this up yet, as you can tell, and I don't know if I will. Honestly, this... <laughs> no, that sounds weird. Um, I might buy another one and just, just so I can keep this in its packaging. That sounds super weird and nostalgic and geeky and weird. I don't know what it is, but something about this presentation just hits me as awesome. Like, it really, really does. Um, it reminds me... My dad used to collect these old... Um, magazine games that he would get like you know those little chit based games with the cardboard and like the hard plastic containers like you know they've invaded pleasantville and things like that old games from the 60s and 70s and this reminds me of that especially this back side i mean i don't know i think it's the the yellow page with the red and then the the green dice something about that presentation and then the black top of it here um it just strikes me as Super nostalgic. I don't know. I love it. Um, I love the art there on the back, that scorpion dude. Um, so I don't even know how this this game is. I, I'm sure it's good. I got it as kind of a two-part thing um, with one of the other products I have here, which is the uh, Scourge of Northland by Jacob Fleming, which is his new um, adventure path or his new, his new hex crawl. Um, but anyway, this came with it. I haven't opened it yet, I can't give a review of it, except to say that the packaging is spot on, at least according to me. So, uh, I'm, I'm sure the game's good. I, I, I might at some point open this up and play it. I don't know. I don't know if I will. I just think I love this, and as like a, as just a collectible, like I think in 30 years, if I have this still on my shelf, I'll look at it and be like, wow, that's, I don't know, it's one of those things. I don't know. Uh, anyway, sounds weird, I know, but it's it's one of the things I had, so I wanted to show it. Um, I'm going to jump, I'll come back to that later, but I wanted to show this first, which is the, I have two of the three books by Jacob Fleming. His third one actually is on the way, it's not here yet, but um, if you guys have ever seen these books, uh, this is the first one, uh, In the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe. It's for old school essentials. Um, look at that art. It's great really is. Jacob Fleming is a great artist, he's a great uh, designer, and the interior art is awesome too. He does all of it as far as I know. Um, classic old school art there. Um, these books are really, really cool. Um, got a map up here. For a number of reasons. The uh, First of all, the region maps, which probably going to be in the back, I imagine. Uh, yeah, the region maps are really cool. Um, and they're done in this very fan, I'm not sure if you can see it on here, but they're done with hexes, and then uh, they're numbered and lettered on the side, of course. And this is a pretty small region. Each of these is, is six miles. Um, it's not terribly big, but it's a little hex crawl, um, regional adventure. And it's it's basically the definition of vanilla D&D. &D. And I mean that in like the, the nicest, most positive way I can put it. Um, like, I mean that positively. I don't mean it negatively. The dungeons are small, but they are proper old-school D&D dungeons with giant spiders and goblins and skeletons and traps and treasure and, you know, nothing terribly too crazy or um, wild. This is not gonzo. This is not um, going to shock or surprise you. This is great presentation, standard D &D. And and the, the presentation is really good. So each of the rooms of the dungeon, so let's take an example here. Uh, you get the approach to the dungeon, the dungeon map, uh, a brief description of it, and then everything is numbered with important points like treasure bullet pointed, things bolded. So really great presentation. And he does everything on two-page spreads, so you're always, you're always right there. If you have a, um, 
a, a dungeon map, the rooms that are associated with that dungeon are right there. So you don't have to flip. Like this is excellent presentation. Um, and if you're willing to, like this is a great book if you were a brand new DM with brand new players to the old school. Like this book and uh, in the Valley of the Manticore and even in the, Sh the, Sh the Scourge of Northland, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this book and um, yeah, it would be a great place to start. But even for more experienced DMs um, and more experienced parties, this provides an excellent like basis for for a campaign, for a, a short adventure. You know, like the way I look at these books is like the first maybe third of my notes for a full campaign, and and like the all the hard lifting done in terms of NPCs and um, locations and dungeon maps, and if I want to tweak a room or add in a monster or connect dungeons. Um, or, or connects, you know, do more things with the town uh, in Karn Boulder, which is the town here, if I want to add some more stuff in. And the game has a few rumors, a few motivations from a few NPCs, but for the most part, it's, it's hinted at rather than laid out. And if you're willing to do a little bit more work, you could really flesh this out into a full, uh, really, really fun, I would say longer term adventure maybe 10 sessions, maybe 20 sessions. Um, but you can take any of these dungeons as a one-shot, run it as like, hey, this is what old school D&D is like. This is the kind of thing you're going to be doing. And, you know, again, without being super shocking, without being super exciting, there are twists and there are things that are unique about this, don't get me wrong. Like a couple of the dungeons are connected in the sort of overworld puzzle, or rather there is writing in certain dungeons and to decipher it, you kind of have to find these overworld statues and decipher parts of a language each one has like corresponding words uh, letters rather and then you can if you put them all together then you can discover the language and that'll help you in lots of different dungeons around the region there are like there's a bandit group that has done this thing and, <laughs> and bad stuff's happening as a result but it's a very slow burn um but the kind of thing that's happening is really cool and could lend itself to a bigger threat a regional threat or something like that so you know it has the potential to become a really complex uh, adventure setting. Um, but in itself, it's a great baseline. So I really recommend this. Uh, and the, the presentation alone is worth it. Even if you just want to have a really cool artifact on the shelf or um, whatever it might be, the art, again, is just really good. Jacob Fleming. Excellent. Now, he has a second book, as I said, in the Valley of the Manticore. I, I have it in PDF form. I don't have it in physical form yet. It's, it's coming, actually. But that one is basically the same in that it's also pretty basic, um, pretty basic D and D. The setting is like the Grand Canyon instead of a generic forest on the wilderness with mountains and hills and stuff. And uh, it's it's more it's more specific. It's like a different flavor of vanilla, maybe a different way. It's, instead of being French vanilla, it's vanilla bean, right? It's a different kind of vanilla, but it's still vanilla. But again, I love vanilla. I think it's a great flavor, and it's a great flavor to add things to, right? Sprinkles or chocolate syrup. You get the you get the metaphor, hopefully. Um, in the Valley of the Manticore, changes it from being sort of location based, right? Here's a dungeon where bad stuff has happened, and it's sort of spreading very loosely into the surrounding region. And there's all these kind of loose connections to different dungeons. In the Valley of the Manticore, is like here are some locations, and then here is a connecting creature, the Manticore himself, who's causing trouble, who's flying around, who's sort of a random encounter you might run into. It has a lair, and you kind of have to build up to fight the Manticore. So it's almost a, it's almost a monster-centered or a, a villain-centered campaign, right? Where there's this one thing or adventure. It's still a hex crawl. It's still a region. It's very similar to the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe in its methods and construction, but there's just that slight shift. And instead of being like, here's just a region, it's now here's a region with a monster. Well, the Scourge of Northland, first of all, same thing, art, excellent, really excellent art. Um, again, cool uh, overworld. This one's much bigger. Uh, these are still hexes. I'm not sure if you can see them, but these are still six-mile hexes, but they're way smaller on this presentation. So you're talking about a much bigger area than in the Tower Shadow of Tower Silver Axe. Still great art. Jacob Fleming did it all. Um, this one is more, I might say, story-based but not in the way that you might be thinking. Okay, so basically, um, it's also vanilla D&D, but this is like your third campaign. So like in the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe is what you get after you, as a brand new dungeon master, built your first like region. And the Valley of the Manticore might be your second campaign where you're like, I'm gonna pick a creature from the Monster Manual and build kind of an adventure around it. Well, this is like your third. This is like, what if there's an orc army 
that's going to invade. That's sort of what this is. The idea is here's a city in the wilderness. It's actually a huge city. It's like 30,000 people, which is, you know, a huge city in D&D &D terms. <laughs> but that's fine, you know. Um, you don't need a... It's not realistic, but who cares, right? It's a, it's a cool city in the middle of nowhere. Um, with like 30,000 people and they're... Um, all of these different factions and potential factions and things going on there, but it only hinted at, just like in the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe, you're given a brief overview of NPCs and locations and, like, hinted, right? So so let me see. So here's, here's the city. You get, um, let's see if I can find the, uh, Obenhold is the place. You're given a city with different districts and locations and NPCs in those districts, and sometimes there's sort of an italicized bit, which is a rumor about that place or NPC. You have the map uh, of the district in the top right with the numbered locations. Um, sometimes you have great art that goes along with a particular location. Then you get a view of the whole city and the uh, exterior locations. And again, some of these are linked. And brief descriptions of them, sometimes rumors. Then you get the uh, the aquifer beneath the city and the tunnels, and you have the thieves guild, the under uh, underland, and uh, the waterworks and the aqu aqueducts and things like that. They're running on under the city with all the tunnels that connect them. And then you have the orcs. Now the orcs have uh, there's there's fewer of them, but they're all warriors, you know. Whereas there's a lot of you know non-combatants in the city, and they're uh, in a nearby well, it's like a hundred miles away, but they're in a nearby uh, stronghold. Uh, this place here, uh, Mount Hagar, or something like that. I forget. I don't know how to say it. Mount Hagar, Mount Hagar, or something like that. Mount Hagar. And they're aggrieved at the humans of Obenhold for, you know, their own reasons, and uh, sort of just reasons to some degree at least. And um, they're planning to go and annihilate them all, or they're they're getting kind of like riled up by their prophets and by their religion and all this stuff which is happening behind the scenes to go and just take them out. And that's basically it. You're given a location, the city, and a bunch of NPCs, and a bunch of hinted at motivations. And then you're given the orcs, and a bunch of NPCs, and a bunch of hinted at motivations, more explicit. And then there's like a, um, there's like a sidebar. I forget where it is. Um, um, where they say, where, where Jacob, the, the, artist, the, the author just says, well, um, at some point, you're going to start having them attack. And, and that's basically it. He doesn't say more than that. After a few weeks of in-game, the orcs should attack the city in, in large numbers. They should besiege the city. And then he has like a, a loose note about how you might want to do uh, mass combat based on just a really simple mechanic if you like ever run into it. And then he goes right into the, the region and the region crawl. And it's just like anything. There's dungeons that are, have, have monsters there, some connections, great art, great maps. Um, some really cool monsters. There's a wyvern nest or a wyvern nest. Um, there's a, a village full of were tigers. Um, this one is definitely a bit more daring. There's more stuff happening. But just like the other books by Jacob Fleming. Um, yeah, look at that. I love that piece of art with the wyvern there. So good. Um, there's some, some bigger creatures. Um, there's some extra magic items that you can find and they connect in certain ways. And then there are these crystals that you can find which are really interesting. They're sort of a something that people are battling over a bit. They make you go crazy, but that's kind of a secret that no one really knows. And um, then you've got these cool maps you can find. This guy, I think this one's, this one's tattooed on the guy's dead, dead body. Um, and then there's some at the end. Um, how to read it and dungeon keys and things like that. So what you get is essentially this book that is vanilla in that it's orcs versus humans, right? With giant spiders and a troll and a wyvern. And so it's not crazy gonzo, you know, art punk D&D, right? We're not talking Morkborg. We're not talking um, ultraviolet grasslands or anything like that. Like I, I like, don't get me wrong, I like that, 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 that stuff too. Like from time to time, I'm I'm all in on a campaign there, but sometimes you got to get back to like just D and D, right? Like like, and this is this is getting back to like D and D, and it's it's really well done, really well presented. It's not that expensive. It's like 10, 15 bucks, especially if you want to get the PDF. You get them real cheap, and you get seventy pages or just about of these of this really good solid basis for your own campaign.
And you could run this as written, but it would be very simple. You know, again, the motivation would be very simple. It would be for brand new players and a brand new DM, just pick this up and run it, and it's not going to be too surprising. There's just enough, like, cool magic, just enough uh, motivation, just enough secrets to to be interesting even to, like, someone who's never, you know, especially to someone who's never played the game. And, and you could play it, and it would be totally fine, solid D&D, but with just a little bit of extra work. And, and Jacob leaves all of those doors unlocked for you. He doesn't open them up, but he leaves them unlocked for you. And I'll give you an example. Like in Openhold, um, one of the one of the places you can find in Openhold is this. Um, let's see, where is it? Um, it's early. Oh yeah, so here for example, there's this giant like 80 foot statue of the founder of the city, but it's in front of the temple, and the priests don't like it, and they they want it t torn down, but they can't just come out and tear it down because of course it's the founder of the city, but they don't want it. And that's all he says is that the the the, the priests would rather have a have a statue of their god. They don't like it. That's the only sort of hint he gives you about that tension between the priests and the ruling class or the ruler herself, uh, which is um, the overlord. And then there's there's this other really, really rich guy in town who maybe has ties to the Thieves' Guild, maybe not. He's certainly the wealthiest guy in town besides the overlord herself. And then you got the Porter's Guild, and there, like, it hints that maybe some people think they're killing off all of the other guilds, or they, they've killed off or scared off all of the other merchant guilds or, or porters guilds or adventurers guilds in town. And there's the, the apothecarists who are actually the assassins, but they're being funded and, and maybe they're being funded uh, by somebody. And, and the, the rumor is that they're actually trying to control the overlord. But again, you're, you're not given anything except the head of the thieves guild later on in the, in the uh, aquifer section. Um, and the overlord herself and her evil advisor, who always wears a mask, or it doesn't say evil advisor, but he's an advisor who always wears his, wears his ceremonial mask. And there's stuff like that. And you're like, why is that there? It's a cool little tidbit. I could build an entire adventure around that. And it wouldn't be hard because he's given you all of these cool little hooks without going into detail onto them. So it's an efficient book. Um, again, he, he's presented to you a bunch of doors and unlocked them all, but he leaves it to you, the DM, to actually go through, open them, and you know fill the rooms with furniture, <laughs> uh, in other words. So I really like this book. I'm going to run it, uh, I think. Um, I, I've, I've taken dungeons from the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe before, and I've run them straight up. They've been great. Um, I think I want to run this as written, or at least, again, use the, the setting and use the conflicts and then build up my own adventure around them. This is really good, uh, and I think this is going to be uh, maybe a mid-range adventure after I finish. Um, after I finish with my uh, Curse of Strahd cam campaign, which who knows how long that'll take. But when I finish that, I think my next one that I was planning, the next big one I was planning, was going to be Dolmenwood when it comes out next year with the actual physical book. Um, and so I think I might, in the interim, if I finish Strahd before Dolmenwood comes out, I think I might run this. It's really good as a, as a mid-campaign. You know, low levels, you're talking starting out level one, and you might go to level what, five or six by the end. So it's not a huge, huge campaign, uh, maybe even four, right, if you if you just did a little bit of it. But however much you played in it, it would be great. The, the overall threat is there. There's enough mid-tier stuff to do. There's just dungeon crawling. There's, there's rumors out in the wilderness, uh, monsters to slay, magic items to find, and I really, really like it. I think you guys should pick this up if you haven't already. All right, the other two scenes that I have first is, uh, well, I'll go with this one first. Um, this is Nightmare Over Ragged Hollow, which is uh, recently released by the Merry Mushmen. It's a really good adventure, also for old school essentials. Once again, we have classic art. Now, this one is interesting because it's been made to look beat up. Like, you can see the covers. I'm not sure if you can see them, but right, it looks like it's been faded. And that's by design. Like, it, it came that way, and it's not actually folded. It's part of the print. Um, and that's cool, because it gives it an old old vibe. You know, it's like, oh, this is an old adventure from a long time ago. But it is very different. So the cover and the back cover, this is the, it's a hex crawl, but it's not really a hex crawl. It's more of a point crawl. I'm not sure if you can see, but there are, like, how long it takes to get from one place to the next. That's kind of a point crawl mentality, I think. It's and rather than being like, here, just a hex, and you're going to find something there and roll and find. It. It's like, no, you're here, and you can go here or here. 
and it's going to take you this long to get there. If you go from Ragged Hollow down to the Ogre Den, it's going to be six hours to the ravine and then an hour to the Ogre Den. So talking like that. Um, but once again, it's, it's a great low-level adventure. But it's very different than Scourge of Northland, where Scourge of Northland is like minimalist. You don't get uh, a ton of extra information. You get the dungeon, and you get a bunch of dungeons, and you get motivations and a bunch of NPCs very loosely. This has a central, like, you're going to be doing this. And it's got one big dungeon with like a, a big bad, and it's sort of, sort of timed events, and things are going to be happening. So it's a very different mentality than Scourge of Northland, um, in one sense, in, in that it gives you a much more specific, narrower adventure but still has a region with some stuff to do now what's interesting about this book is that it actually isn't one book I and mean, this is these are separate i didn't break it or rip it this is the front this is the cover of the thing obviously but it actually serves as your map of your main dungeon which is your temple um the the temple in ragged hollow itself and it's got several floors it's got the main floor it's got some crypts below it you have uh, the rooms broken down by description down here or rather by name along with number and then it has your random encounters over here on your random encounter table you could basically use this as a screen like it it can stand right like it can stand up and you could use this as your screen you could just put your little book there and use this as a screen you'd have your map on the inside the only information on the outside that you well, that you have here is you have a map of let's see you have a map of ragged hollow itself the town but that could easily face the players because they would have that sort of and then you have a map of the region which might be a bit more problematic because there's some places on here they might not initially know about but if you just said like they're locals which the campaign may be kind of at one of the ways of starting it assumes they are then they would know the region and so you could just put it there maybe you know maybe you just tell them find a way to tell them some of the secrets that are on here. Otherwise, be right there. And then everything else on here is just the art. And then this is the playtesters and people who died in the playtest. And then this little table down here gives you ways that the party uh, came together in the first place. So once you use that in your initial se session, if you need it, never need it again. So this can serve as a screen. I don't know if I would use it as a screen, but it can. So it's cool that it comes with that. But then the book itself is uh, also fantastic. Now, once again, we get great art, but this it's very different style. You get this kind of like red, white, pink. I'm not sure what the, the actual description of it is, um, but it's very different. But it, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's throughout the whole book. You get great art once again. Now, this has a really interesting mechanic. The basic idea is that there's this uh, bad thing <laughs> that has happened in the temple in Ragged Hollow but that you can't get into the temple right away. There's essentially this golden dome of magic that's protecting the church and nothing can get in and nothing can get out. But that as time progresses, the dome gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually it'll go away, in which case everything bad inside will get out. So there's a timer, but initially you can't even interact with the temple. So for the first seven days of the campaign, in-game seven days, you can't even get into the temple through any means. But by the seventh day, the dome has shrunk enough that you can get in through the bell tower, through the roof, and you have to then go down through the dungeon is kind of the idea. So there's this built-in wall preventing you from entering into the, the big dungeon, meaning you're going to spend some time doing other stuff. There's a dungeon, a small dungeon in town, which is basically like this little um, ruined... Here's the map of the town. Uh, there's a, an isle, a, a house on an island, and one of the hooks is that the players maybe inherited it. And so they come to Ragged Hollow, and they're like, hey, what's happening with the temple? That's weird. Well, it doesn't stop us from doing our thing. And they go and do their temple, and that leads them elsewhere, and it becomes kind of a, a regional adventure with some, some minor quests around the region in the days leading up to the, the temple actually being um, accessible. And then once it's accessible, they can go in. But the NPCs in the town are delightful. They're, they're fun. They each have their own motivations. Every, every location has at least one NPC who has something that they want, maybe a secret. Other NPCs can be associated with it. Um, and then as the dome disappears, bad stuff starts to happen at night in Ragged Hollow. And so it starts to get scarier and scarier and spookier and spookier. Um, and then really everything will end. But inside the temple are, were a certain number of people who were in there when, it, when they basically when they got trapped by it. Let's see if I can find that um, again. Yeah, so you have a list of 36 NPCs who were inside the temple when it got locked down. 
And as the, the time progresses, they can start dying off. And in fact, that's sort of the timer, is that when it gets to zero, then everything, the last of the heroes, the last of the people inside dies, and that's what lets the bad stuff out. And so as the time progresses, people are dying in there. You're rolling every, every time the bell tolls. You roll a d4, and that number of people die. And then you roll 3d6 to see who dies. You mark them off the list, and then by the time the players actually get in there, they're no longer there. So there's a sort of interesting time element where if... I'm not sure how the players would know this. Maybe there's a, a way in the adventure that I missed for them to know that people are dying. But certainly they'll figure it out once they enter in, and they'll realize, uh-oh, we got to do this, and the, the longer we wait, the worse this gets for people in here. So there's a sort of element of, of double timer. There's the timer happening because bad stuff will happen, but also a timer because people are dying. And, and if you're, especially if you've now moved into the town to live here, like you know that the mansion is yours or something like that, or you get to you get to know and like the town, and you're going to want to do something about it as heroes. So there's a little dungeon in town, but then there are those three regions. There's the Gloamwood. Um, well, what are they called? There's the Gloamwood, the uh, Wailing Hills, and the Bleak Mountains. Uh, very cheery names. And uh, there's just stuff happening in each of them, as you might expect. There's witches and kobolds and ogres. Uh, giant creatures, and this one has a lot more weirdness. I wouldn't say it's Gonzo, but it has a lot more weirdness than something like Scourge of Northland. Um, it's okay with weird creatures and weird effects and uh, just, you know, gross stuff happening to people. Classic bandits, um, you know, getting in over their heads. And then there's the dungeon itself, the temple itself. And uh, it is, is really good. It's a good dungeon. Lots of good interaction, lots of good choices. And, uh, you know, really great evocative imagery and art. And a good big bad, I think. I think. It'd be interesting to see how the players interact with the big bad, kind of. Um, but very solid adventure. Uh, I, I, I really recommend this one, too. It doesn't fit the tone that I tend to prefer, which is more either really weird um, or uh, more, more vanilla. I, I kind of like one or the other extreme. Um, but this is a nice, like, mid-tier weirdness. <laughs> Good, solid fantasy RPG um, with some fun stuff. Like, there's different ways the game can, like, the end game can go happen, can go through. And if you get to the end, it's not the same every time because uh, the players can make different choices about who they save or what they save and what they do with, with the uh, stuff at the end. I won't spoil anything. And then you have um, magic items. And then you have uh, potential recruits from the town. And they're pretty silly. Uh, like, there's a robot, Max 77... Um, it's just, it's, you know, it's pretty silly, but you can find them in town. You can use it or not, doesn't, obviously. Necessarily. And they can also serve as, like, starting characters. And you have a character sheet on the back. So Nightmare of Ragged Hollow is really, really good. Once again, I, I'd recommend it, um, especially if you're more into, um, like, a story that is kind of happening. I mean, there's a story, like, the Scourge of Northland has a story that's going on in the background. The orcs are going to attack, but there's stories that for you to make up. This one is like, there's a, a main story happening. That one's like a sandbox for the DM as well as the players, because there's a lot of tools and a lot of stuff going on, and you can set up your own castles. <laughs> this one is like, it's got a story, it's got NPCs, it's got connections, it's got all that pre-made. You're going to enter into the region, it's all going to be there for you. And uh, what the players choose to interact with or not, that's up to them. But uh, it's all already done for you. So this is a great um, pre-made starting adventure for Old School Essentials, whereas I would say this one, Scourge of Northlands, um, requires a little more work to make interesting, whereas this is built interesting right away. So depending on what suits your taste, pick one or the other. This one tends to be my preference, but I think a lot of people would pick this, and I could totally understand why. And last but not least is this, uh, it was, it was uh, the barkeep on the Borderlands, which is, was kickstarted a while back and it hit kind of with uh, a boom when it was first kickstarted. I think everybody knew about it. Um, and it kind of fell, out a little, fell off a little bit, and I didn't hear too much about it after that. But um, it came with a lot of cool extras, the map uh, and a little cocktail uh, for making your own drinks. <laughs> cocktail, uh, what do you call that? Bookmark. Um, and it has other things too, coasters that I got in the Kickstarter and all that stuff. So this is a pub crawl, not a hex crawl or a point call crawl. It's a pub crawl. And uh, so you have, it's a point crawl really, right? <laughs> but what you're looking at is um, a map of a bunch of taverns in uh, the old city, the old keep on the borderlands, right? 
uh, Borderlands uh, is now long past that. That's a long go tradition that the you know the Caves of Chaos and all that stuff. Now there's the Raves of Chaos, which is what they're doing here, and basically it's the Church of Chaos gets to take over for the night, and everyone gets drunk and has a big party in the city. But there's sort of like a story going on, and um, you've got these. Um, Major factions and people, you know, the art in here is, is again really great. A little bit silly, but that's okay. Um, I, I like it. It's just a little bit silly. That's fine. That's the tone of this adventure is going to be silly. I mean, you're talking about a pub crawl. Uh, there are rules for getting drunk and, like, mean, you know, staying on your feet and stuff like that. Um, there's different neighborhoods and the different bars in each neighborhood. And then uh, a timeline of the Raves of Chaos, what's actually going on through these six days of the, the rave itself, and what happens on day one, and the rumors that you hear during that day, and then it goes forward. So you're playing over the course of a few days, and you're you know, getting to the, the, the climax, which is, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, basically the, the king is dying, and the antidote was mixed up with a lot of other alcohol in the shipments into the city, and so now people need to find it. And so you're kind of doing that. You got to go from place to place. You have to, you know, hide it that you're going. It's <laughs> there's a lot of different ways you could approach it, but the majority of this book is just descriptions of each bar, what's going on there, uh, what the signature drinks are, uh, you know, who's there, weird sidetracks that you can get involved in there, situations that might develop there, um, and then it really is just bar after bar, and there's a timeline of where the. Um, you know, where the uh, antidote is at any one time and who has it, because there's things happening in the background. The players are kind of trying to stumble onto it. They might stumble onto its trail and then follow it um, from bar to bar. They might accidentally just happen to run into it. Uh, they might not run into it at all, right? They might just get into their own side quests and wackiness and craziness, and then the king dies, all <laughs> right? And that's that. That was that, that version of it. But you could play this multiple times, either with the same group or with different groups, and, and it would be... A, a, a heck of a lot of fun, I think. Um, the Ship of Thesis, or the sh Ship of Thesis? Yeah, it's the Ship of Thesis, instead of the Ship of Theseus. There's just a lot of really cool puns and jokes, and it's it's just funny. This game would be, um, I haven't run it. The art on the cover is awesome. Again, silly, but awesome. I haven't run it, I probably will at some point because just like, you know, a bachelor party, or like, you know, <laughs> uh, you can tell the kind of friends I have that I'd be playing D&D &D at a bachelor party, but you get the point. Like, just someone's birthday, or like, you're going to have a night with your friends, and you're like, hey, let's just do Barkeep on the Borderlands. And, you know, we don't have any time to prep. Let's just roll a few funny characters from, you know, Maze Rats or OSR games. Some, something easy where you can make a quick character, Shadow Dark, right? A level zero character, a level one character, and then just like, jump into this and start to have some wacky adventures in a town while everyone's getting drunk. Super fun. Anyway, those are some of the zines. Actually, that's basically all the zines I have. I have a whole bunch more books, but those are the ones that I have at the moment. Um, so I hope this was interesting. Hope you guys enjoy this. I'd recommend any of these products, honestly, buy them. The, none of them are too expensive. Um, I'd recommend getting them all because they're, well, can you ever really have too many adventures? All right, guys, I'll let you all go. See you around.